Today is my pleasure to introduce you to John McDonald, CEO of Clear Object, Inc. Magazine's fastest growing IT company in Indiana for the past three years. With that, I'll pass it over to John. Thanks, Andrea. Great to uh, talk to all of you today, uh, wherever you're at, uh, taking in this webinar. It's one of my favorite topics. I'm a little biased about it, but uh, as I've said before, and many people have also figured out that the Internet of Things is the biggest thing since anything. And the title of our webinar today is The New Crossroads. Here in Indiana, our motto is The Crossroads of America. But in many ways, the intersection of technology and the insertion of software into everyday products and the ability to grab data from that and understand what that data says is really the new crossroads. It's the crossing of technology with industries like manufacturing, transportation, logistics, and agriculture. And that creates entirely new business models driven by data and exciting changes for companies. And certainly it creates winners and losers. And so what a smart decision you made today to listen to some of this insight that we've been able to gather and be able to help and shape and form your own ideas of what it is that you want to do with IoT. So the first slide in our presentation is just an observation. Um, first and foremost, we can see these logos on the screen. Um, Airbnb, uh, the largest hotelier in the world, owns no hotels. Uh, Alibaba, the largest retailer in the world, owns no stores. Uh, Facebook, the largest content company in the world, makes no content. Uh, Netflix, the largest broadcaster in the world, has no TV cameras, owns no broadcast studios, has no antennas. And the largest car rental company in the world owns no cars. Uh, what is that it that unifies all five of these companies and so many other ones? And the answer is what they actually control is the data. Uh, they make their business on understanding what is available out there um, in the form of hotel rooms, products, content, broadcast material, cars that are available to come by, and then connect you up with that data as a consumer. They deal in the, as a middle man of data. And that's a clue to what it is that's the heart of every new economy company. It's all about the data. When you apply that idea to the Internet of Things and start to understand that it too is really all about data. Some observations here as well. There are some 33 um, autonomous vehicle programs that are underway right now in the world that we know about. There are five levels of autonomous vehicles. Uh, level zero, as I like to joke, is my grandfather's uh, pickup truck, as in no uh, autonomous capability. Uh, level one is in pretty much every vehicle today. It's uh, cruise control, things like that. Simple. Uh, mechanisms that allow you to maintain your speed on the freeway and, and, and uh, get to the destination in a relatively safe way. Level two is something that some vehicles have today, largely um, more luxury vehicles. It's things like adaptive cruise control, where the car can sense the distance between the car in front of you and adapt its speed and slow or speed up based on that, or lane keeping assist, where a car can sense the lane on the road and either warn you when you're off the lane or even help uh, nudge you back onto the right lane like a bumper. A uh, good number of luxury vehicles have this today. Uh, level three uh, autonomous vehicles is actually a vehicle that many uh, companies uh, are trying to skip over. And it's a vehicle that can essentially drive itself but requires fairly active driver input. Um, think of a, uh, the ability to remove your hands from the steering wheel and the car will stay on the road moving the same direction, largely without your input. But you can never be too far away from it. You need to be ready to kind of grab the wheel and give it immediate input. In fact, some of the vehicle systems, vehicles that have these systems, actually will buzz or beep every 15, 20 seconds whenever um, it doesn't sense your hands are on the wheel to make sure that you're still paying attention and not text messaging away. You can see why they're trying to skip this level. Um, the fourth level, is a vehicle that will drive itself from a destination A to B um, without any driver input whatsoever um, under all normal circumstances. And if um, there is a problem, the vehicle will fail safely. So think of a vehicle that you can program uh, a destination, take your hands off the wheel and push start, 
and it will drive itself down public roads from where you're at to where you're going. In all normal circumstances, all traffic situations, slow down, speed ups, traffic lights, turning, turn signals, all the rest, uh, even these infuriating roundabouts that we seem to have coming up all over America, except when there is a fault condition that the vehicle can't handle and then it will fail safely. So think of the road being blocked or a bridge being out and the car will slow down, stop and pull over and wait for driver input. The last autonomous vehicle level is level five and that is a vehicle that has no steering wheel whatsoever. It's a vehicle that there is no, in fact, driver other than the car itself. There's no opportunity for the, anyone to co command the car. It's just not there. Level four autonomous vehicles begin to appear in the product roadmap in some manufacturers, some major manufacturers, as early as the 2021-2022 model year. Um, and if you consider the fact that there is a half-life of technology, as in the amount of time it takes for a given technology to be present in half of the things that are out there in the marketplace. So the average life of a vehicle is between six and eight years, which means it takes between three and four years for half the vehicles on, a, on the road to have a particular uh, thing. So somewhere between 2024 and uh, 2027, about half the vehicles on the road should have, according to this product roadmap timeline, um, level four autonomous vehicle capability. So if you think that we're not going to have autonomous vehicles, you are mistaken. So let's consider for a minute what some of the impact of that is on the world around us. Uh, the first impact is to think about all of the time that we as humans spend uh, driving down the road with our eyes not on computer screens or on a good book or on some collaborative work project with someone else, but watching road reflectors zip by and trying to keep the, the car on the road. If you multiply that amount of time in any average human's life and you multiply that by the number of humans on the road driving, it's a staggering amount of time that we waste driving vehicles. In fact, I contend it's probably one of the biggest leaps in human productivity ever because we're about to get all of that time back. It's an amazing amount of human capability and capital that we're about to be able to reapply to all kinds of things that otherwise would have been stealing our time to be able to keep a car on the road. If you have autonomous vehicles that are driving themselves, um, well, first of all, you can run them bumper to bumper. The reason we have uh, the distance we do is because humans can only react at a certain speed, but uh, computers can react much faster. Uh, we don't need the distance between vehicles. Um, and that effectively makes every road uh, a train line and every car a private train car. Uh, we also don't have to run them at uh, 65 miles an hour. We can run them at 200 miles an hour. Uh, if you have um, this going on, you need far less roads. You can actually remove a lot of roads and certainly extra lanes in those roads because you don't need them. Thus, putting out of business uh, all forms of public transportation, because everything is a public form of transportation, and putting out of business short-haul airlines. Because if I can go to Chicago from Indianapolis at 200 miles an hour, I can go there for lunch. I don't need Southwest Airlines to take me there anymore. Um, if you consider the impact on uh, safety, what you realize is that um, vehicles driven by humans are inherently unsafe. During the course of this webinar, uh, many humans will lose their lives in traffic accidents, which are effectively 100% preventable. Um, it's been over a decade since there has been a major loss of life aircraft accident in a commercial airline in North America. It's an unprecedented period of time in aviation, and it's largely because humans have been removed from all kinds of aspects of flight, because humans are, in fact, the unreliable part of it. In fact, my own daughter took till she was almost 19 years old to be able to get her driver's license because for her, driving a vehicle is, um, well, it causes anxiety, <laughs> to be honest. Um, for her, driving a vehicle is just about as, as uh, anxiety-filled as giving her the keys to an airplane and saying, fly to another city. Um, she would much prefer to hop in an Uber vehicle and have her uh, uh, transportation needs taken care of by somebody else who's better trained to drive a vehicle than she is. 
it's an odd thing to think about when you're my age because I think I was at the Bureau of Motor Vehicles about 32 seconds after midnight on my, on my birthday or certainly minutes after they opened the next day. Um, but a lot of children today, a lot of teenagers today, uh, find driving to be a scary thing and are not the least bit interested in doing it. If you take that to its logical conclusion, you realize that if no humans are driving vehicles, um, we could prevent most, if not all, traffic deaths. In fact, there'll be a day when we, in fact, ban driving by humans for public safety reasons. Now apply that thought to delivery vehicles and automated transportation. Many people believe and have written about the fact that, that automated vehicles will probably begin in the trucking industry and probably during off hours of the night and probably in remote areas. Think you know, a freeway across Montana between 1 and 5 a.m., which will probably be designated automated only. In other words, it'll be illegal to drive a truck on that road unless your truck is in automated mode. The uh, picture on your screen is a prototype uh, electric vehicle, a uh, delivery vehicle from UPS that uses drones to pick up boxes at, inside the vehicle and fly them out a hole in the top of the roof and drop them on your uh, lawn. Imagine a world, uh, world today we already have. I have the ability to get on Amazon.com and, and uh, <clears throat> with Amazon Prime now, I can have a good array of things, goods and services delivered within hours, if not certainly by the end of the day, uh, to my house. So if I were to order a book right now online, by the time I got to my house tonight uh, for dinner, um, it would be there on my doorstep. But imagine a world where you have more distribution centers and more of these vehicles uh, literally, you'd be able to order a T-shirt, and 15 minutes later, one of these vehicles would drive up with a drone and drop the box on your on your front lawn. And don't be worried if you open the box and the T-shirt is the wrong size. You just hop back online, put the T-shirt back in the box. 15 minutes later, out comes the drone, picks up the old box, and drops a new one on your on your lawn. So, if you think about that for a minute, again, it's logical conclusion. You don't need stores. Uh, there's no reason anymore to go to a place to get a product if they're all being delivered to your doorstep. By the way, this is not the only thing that you can deliver to your doorstep. Um, oftentimes we go to places like hospitals because we can get access to equipment that's too expensive and the, uh, and the people who know how to operate it. But you can imagine things like an um, automated vehicle that drives an MRI machine on the back of a truck to my curb in front of my house. And uh, I walk out of my house and walk onto the back of the truck, put a code in the door, the door pops open, walk in, sit down, fully lit, and up on video screens on the inside are technicians thousands of miles away, maybe specialized doctors that know exactly what it is that they're saying, maybe the best in the world. So you sit down, Mr. McDonald, strap yourself in, just a second, please, beep, beep, we're all done, thanks, have a nice day, and the MRI machine drives off. Now I don't need to go to a hospital in these germ-infested buildings to be able to get a test like that done because it's delivered to my doorstep. And if you question whether or not this idea of not needing stores is already happening, uh, on the screen are some logos of just a few of the companies that have either completely gone out of business or closed more than 100 stores in just the last six months. So the truth is this is already happening right now, live in front of our eyes. It's not a future statement. It's already occurring. And it all comes back to this idea of data and being able to know what it is that we need in the context that we need it and be able to provide it to us on demand and having the devices themselves tell us, in fact, even betray us about what it is that we're doing and offer us those goods and services in the context of our current need. What's been happening here is a transition from the first stages of the Internet into this new Internet of Things. Uh, in the old model, um, the Internet primarily existed as an Internet of people. Um, in other words, the devices that we created were designed to interface uh, humans to the Internet, to make us effective endpoints in the Internet. Uh, the cell phone that I have, if I don't have it connected to the network, is utterly useless. Um, it doesn't even keep time very well <laughs> without being connected to the Internet. Um, and I have five senses, um, but my iPhone has 12, 
right? And all of these senses are essentially designed to augment me as a human being and make me a better endpoint to the Internet. Where am I at? Is it night or day? How fast am I moving? What are my eyes seeing through its cameras? Uh, which direction am I headed? What's the air temperature? What's the air pressure? It's all about trying to augment me with additional sensitivity because I as a human unfortunately fail with only having five senses and I'm not very good at it. But lest there be any mistake, uh, things are not people. And if you need any proof points of this, well, the first one I already gave you, things are more sensitive than people. Um, you can put more sensors on things than people have sensors. Um, we have five, as we mentioned before. There's a city in Spain that has over 20,000 of them deployed all over their city. So they can know what's going on in all kinds of places in the city. Um, there are more things than there are people. Um, IDC estimates that there will be 27 billion devices connected to the Internet by 2021. Way more things than people. Uh, things can go where people can't. The lowest point of the ocean is 36,070 feet below sea level. And though no human can survive down there, wouldn't you bet, what's at the bottom of there? A box of sensors. They can be where humans can't. And humans have more things to say than, uh, the sensor, uh, things have more things to say than humans. Uh, as I like to joke, even my mother-in-law. Uh, <laughs> the windmills that are deployed all over our country, um, generating electricity, uh, for us, have send out 400 data points every second, each one of them. So they have a lot more to say. And what are they saying? Data. They're sending a crushing amount of data, far more than humans have ever sent across the line with these devices designed to interface us to the network. The devices speaking for us are sending way more information. And how are they doing this? They're doing this because they have become way smarter, primarily through software, although also through great sensors and technology, but primarily through software. An F-22 Raptor, a Lockheed Martin F-22 Raptor, has 1.7 million lines of code in it, a device that was largely conceived in the late 1970s. By contrast, a Boeing 787 Dreamliner, a device largely conceived in the early 1990s, has 6.5 million lines of code in it. But a 2017 Mercedes-Benz S-Class has 20 million lines of code in it, 14 million of which are in the radio alone. And that just goes to show you the staggering amount of software that's now dealing with, it, that we now have to deal with as humans. In fact, that car radio or infotainment system is probably the most sophisticated computing device most humans will use on a daily basis that has to boot successfully within two seconds of pushing the power button every time. It's an amazing device in and of itself, and it's really the heart of the vehicle, and it's an expl explanation and, and an exposition of the amount of software that is now in these devices that is now capable of sending data back. A story I like to tell all the time, and apologies for those of you who've heard it before, is the story of you driving down the road in your car and your car notices that you're not keeping your lane as successfully as you did maybe an hour ago. And it also recognizes that it's 3 a.m. and it thinks that you might be tired. So it also knows that four exits up is a 24-hour Starbucks and that you like uh, cold brew with, with four Splendas in it. So on the screen of the radio, it asks you, would you like me to order you a cold brew with four Splendas in it? And if you say yes or no, it will order the drink for you and perhaps even help steer the vehicle to the drive through window so you can pick up the drink and drive on the car that's having saved its own life and yours. With all that software and those car radios, um, I can tell you with great confidence that the radios that are coming off the line today and the cars that have them in them are perfectly capable of doing what I just said, of knowing that you're weaving in your lane and ordering you coffee and having your payment information and sending it forward. They can do that today, to which you might be asking the question, hey, I own a new vehicle. How come my car doesn't send me a coffee requests? And the answer to the question is because you don't want it to. <laughs> because if you think about it, 
how many other people or organizations would you not like to know that you're in your car at 3 a.m. weaving in your lane? I would not want my wife to know that. I would not want to. I would not want my uh, insurance company to know that. Um, I would not want the state police department to know that. Um, and so the reality is, I don't let anybody know that because I can't control the data that's coming from my car. I can't make decisions right now about who I want to have see that data and what kinds of products and services I would be open to. Um, because it's not just Starbucks that wants that data or the state police, it's also Dunkin' Donuts wants that data. Um, Hilton would like that data because they have a hotel room that didn't sell the night before that they'd like to give me at half price. And who wants their car spamming them as they drive down the freeway every exit off making you all these offers? Nobody wants that because you can't control it. But it betrays you, and that data gives you a glimpse into the future of how valuable that little bit of data weaving in the lane in the middle of the night, one single solitary car, can be to so many organizations who would love to get their hands on that data and leverage that data and offer you products and services based on the context. That's exactly what it is that we're talking about. So what are the industries that are being changed right now live by the Internet of Things more than any others? Well, the first industry that's being changed uh, very radically by this is the manufacturing industry. In fact, IoT is used in two contexts in manufacturing. One is sort of industrial manufacturing, uh, where you're using it in the production process of manufacturing itself. The other one is in the devices that are manufactured, making them smarter. Or if you will, you can use IoT in manufacturing to make products better or to make better products. Uh, example of this, here in uh, our city, we have a company called Rolls-Royce, and they make jet aircraft engines. Um, used in all kinds of applications. Um, they're also the pioneer of a business model called Power by the Hour. And Power by the Hour is a model whereby um, airlines or other businesses that use aircraft engines don't actually own the aircraft engines that they use. In fact, what they do is they pay Rolls-Royce a fee to use engines. Um, power by the Hour. So it's Rolls-Royce's job to make sure that there's two working engines strapped onto that plane before it backs away from the gate. This is good for the airlines because it means that they can have a predictable expense that they can plan and budget around. It's really good for Rolls-Royce because it creates a recurring revenue stream that they can rely on after the sale of the engine. But it also means that the data about the performance of the engine becomes very, very important to Rolls-Royce because if they strap on 13 lemon engines before they found the 14th one that works, uh, the airline doesn't care, <laughs> right? That's all on Rolls-Royce. So knowing how those engines are performing and where the maintenance issues are becomes very, very important to them. So they have to put sensors in the engines, they have to have smarts in the control units, and they have to stream the data back so that they can know when and where the engines are needing service and how to deploy their resources most efficiently to be able to keep the fleet operational and not have any screw-ups. Another industry that's being radically changed by IoT is the transportation logistics industry, or moving things. Now, Cummins Engine has introduced a uh, system called Connected Diagnostics, and what it does is it senses uh, when engines are having fault codes uh, or things that would turn on the check engine light in your car. Uh, these are largely caused by emissions issues. Uh, diesel engines can sometimes be finicky when you drive them up and down mountains or in arid or wet areas. And so um, the truck driver doesn't really know what to do with these fault codes, and the fleet operator really needs to know what to do with these fault codes but doesn't really know what either, but Cummins does. And so they collect them to the tunes of thousands of them a day and provide messages to the fleet operators about what it is that that fault code means and what they should do about it. They're doing that to provide a service to their customer. It enhances the value of the engine. And to the fleet operator, it improves the performance of their fleet. And to the truck driver, it gives them peace of mind related to the vehicle that they're driving, that it's well-maintained and operating perfectly. Uh, it's a huge value 
to their customers. And it's a wonderful system and a wonderful example of how IoT is being used in the transportation logistics industry. Third industry that's being radically changed by IoT is agriculture. This is an interesting example. There's a company out of Minneapolis who has been working on a device called a robot, cleverly misspelled as R-O-W-B-O-T. But what's the goal of this device? The goal of this device is to have um, essentially a drone that can roll up on tractor treads up and down the rows of corn or soybeans or whatever, sampling the soil, injecting on that very spot a particular chemical compound in water that's perfect for maintaining the balance of nutrients and water in that spot of soil, can perhaps zap weeds with hot air or, or light beams, reducing the amount of herbicides needed, and then roll on to the next plot, rinse and repeat, rinse and repeat, over and over again, all night long, all day long. In fact, we're learning that kind of makes some sense. We tell you not to mow your lawn or water your lawn in the blazing hot sun of the day, we're kind of learning that it's maybe better to do agriculture at night. Since the dawn of agriculture, we've been doing it in broad daylight because that's when we can see. But it might actually be better for the plants to do it in the dead of night. So you can see a, a, a time where there aren't any farmers running tractors up and down the fields. In fact, they're asleep in bed while these little devices are moving up and down the field and fleets, optimizing the soil on an inch-by-inch -inch basis. So these three industries, making things, moving things, growing things, are the ones that are the ones that are being changed so rapidly right now by IoT. And what is IoT about? It's about data. It's about data coming directly from the devices and not through human interfaces. And the new economy is based simply on the idea that data is the power. It's the gold. And controlling that data and understanding that data and leveraging that data not only makes you a better business, it creates entire new business models. And there's not one thing about the world that we are in that isn't affected, if not completely radically changed, uh, by the Internet of Things. And with that, I'd like to thank you all for joining and listening to a little bit of our vision and picture around where the Internet of Things is going here at Clear Object. Um, thank you, John. Uh, we're now going to be answering some of the questions submitted during today's presentation. As a reminder, you can still submit your questions through the Q&A box on your console. So I've heard about IoT the past few years, but don't know how to incorporate it into my company. Any suggestions? One of the things that we've learned at Clear Object is that there are these visionaries inside of organizations. Um, unfortunately for us, they don't really have a common job title. They could be as high as the CEO or as mid-level as a product manager or you know, just an engineer on the, on the product line. Um, but what they do is they share one common thing, that they can see what's happening to the world around us, and they can see what's happening to the product. And they're not necessarily happy with what they see. In fact, some of the folks are in somewhat of a near panic about the inability of the rest of their organization to see and understand what's going on. Uh, we've learned that those people need a safe place to let those ideas grow, uh, that they need to externalize those ideas, get them out of the four walls, because you don't necessarily have all of the capability to bring those resources to bear to make that idea work. And that's about catalyzing the idea about doing good ideation and good development and good edge technology and good cloud and weaving those pieces together. And then you often need help in um, capitalizing on those ideas because you need to get funding to be able to drive those things forward, either internally or you know, through some other external capital resources. So um, if you're one of those entrepreneurs, we like to call it, who sees the future, recognize that the best thing you can do is work to externalize your ideas and get them out of there into a place where you can catalyze them and get some help on capitalizing on them. Um, that's how you can get started. Recognize that it's probably not going to happen completely within the four walls of your company because there's just too many disciplines and things are moving too quickly for you to have all the skills and resources and support and capital that you need internally. Wonderful. Thank you. That is all the questions we received. So I will let everyone get on with their afternoons. This recorded webinar on behalf of ClearObject, we'd like to thank you for joining us today and have a great rest of your day.